In this video and the next two, we're going to see a fast implementation of the priority queue that uses every trick in the book. We'll start in this video by reviewing two simpler implementations, the binary heap and the binomial heap, and also a third implementation that you might have thought of and then dismissed as too dumb for words, but which does actually have a useful lesson. We should start though by reminding ourselves what a priority queue is. A priority queue is a collection of items, each with a priority value or key, and we want to be able to pick out the one with the lowest key. We use priority queues for all sorts of things. In this course, the big use has been in Dijkstra's algorithm, where the items in the queue are vertices in a graph, and the key is the distance that we've found to that vertex. In my work, I also use them for simulation, for event-driven simulation, where each item is an agent of some sort, and the key is the time at which it needs to be woken up to do some activity, and the simulator's job is just to repeatedly wake up the next agent, tell it to do its work, and then advance the clock until the next agent is ready. Here's the formal definition of the abstract data type. It supports pop min to pick out the item with the smallest key. It supports push to add a new item with its key to the queue. And it supports decrease too. Dijkstra's algorithm uses this whenever it finds a better path to a vertex. And in a simulator, you'd use it also to say, hey, this agent actually needs to be woken up earlier than previously planned. Why no increase key, you may be wondering. Two reasons actually, one practical and one theoretical. The practical reason is that the algorithm we're going to be studying was devised especially to make Dijkstra's algorithm run blazingly fast, and Dijkstra's algorithm doesn't need an increase key. And the theoretical reason is that there's basically no way to implement increase key that's cleverer than just setting your item's key to be negative infinity, popping it, then pushing it back with a new key, and that's so trivial and ugly that it would be a blemish to include it here. One other comment. Sometimes when you see priority queue defined, people list a few extra methods for peeking at the min item without popping it, for deleting a value, and for merging two priority queues. But we don't need them for Dijkstra's algorithm, and anyway, they're pretty easy to implement, and so I won't discuss them any further. OK, on to our first implementation, the binary heap. A binary heap is an almost full binary tree, every level full apart from the bottom. And it satisfies the heap property, which says every node's key is less than or equal to those of its children. So for example, zero is less than one and five, one is less than or equal to six and to one, and so on. And here's how it works. Let's start with pop min. Because of the heap property, we know that the min item is sitting there at the root of the tree, and so we can just extract it. We can't have a tree without a root, so we need to replace it, and we'll replace it with the last element in the heap. This is no good. We have a heap violation, and we need to fix it. We can just bubble down the heap violator pushing it down by swapping it with the smaller of its children, down and down the heap, comparing to its children at each step, and stop once we've gotten ourselves a proper heap again. OK, so that's pop min. Next, let's look at how to push a new item into the heap. We'll just bung it on at the end. But this is no good, it's a heap violation. This item is smaller than its parent. And to fix the violation, we can bubble it up the tree swapping it with its parent, and keep bubbling up as far as it needs to go until we're back to a nice heap. And decrease key is basically the same. You just decrease the key you're interested in, then bubble it up as far as it needs to go. OK, let's review. The three operations are all very similar. They all involve going up or down the tree, so the running time complexity is big O of the height of the tree. And because it's a nearly full binary tree, it's easy to work out the height. It's just log n, where n is the number of items in the heap. OK, next implementation, 
the binomial heap. Actually, for this one, first we need to define something else, a binomial tree. This is the name for trees with a very particular shape. A binomial tree of degree zero is a single node on its own, a tree with just one item. If you take two binomial trees of degree zero and merge them, you get a binomial tree of degree one. And if you take two trees of degree one and merge them, you get a binomial tree of degree two, and so on. The word degree, by the way, just means number of edges. When we say binomial tree of degree three, we're talking about the root node, which has three edges coming out of it, i.e. the root node has degree three. Okay, so now we can explain what a binomial heap is. A binomial heap is a collection of binomial trees with the restriction that we're only allowed at most one tree of any given degree. Here I've drawn in the missing trees with dotted lines just to indicate this heap doesn't have any tree of degree one or two. Also, another condition, each tree is required to be a heap. In other words, all the nodes satisfy the heap property that a node's key is less than or equal to those of its children. Let's see how they work, starting with push. To push a new item, we just plonk it into the list of trees. But it's messed up our binomial heap. Now we have two trees of the same degree, namely zero, which were not allowed. And to fix the problem, we can just merge these two trees together, like so. We took two trees of degree zero, and we merged them to make a tree of degree one. Just note how we merge them. We put the four underneath the three. That's the way they have to go to satisfy the heap condition. And now in this particular case, we're done. If there were already a degree one tree here, we'd have had to do another merge and keep merging until we recover a proper binomial heap, no more than one tree of each degree. Next operation, decrease key. Here, I'll take this bottom node, the one with key 12, and I'll decrease it to two. This means it's now in violation of the heap property. It's smaller than its parent. So we need to do something to fix up the heap. And we'll do exactly what we did for the binary heap. We'll just bubble this heap violating node up the tree until we get back to a nice heap. Finally, pop min. First, extract the smallest item. We know that each of the trees is a heap. That's what it means to be a binomial heap. And so the smallest item must be one of the roots. And we can just scan through all the trees and pick out the one with the smallest root and we extract it, which leaves some orphans, which we promote to the top level But this is no good. It's not a binomial heap anymore. It's got two trees of the same degree, which isn't allowed. We fix this exactly like we did with push. We'll merge trees of equal degree. Remember, when we merge them, we want to end up with a heap. In this case, three is smaller than six. So we'll make three be the root and we'll make six be the child. Well, we're still not done. There are still two trees of equal degree, so we'll merge them. And now we're done. There might be a whole load of mergers that we need to do. And in fact, the whole process ends up looking a lot like adding together two binary numbers. Let's see why. When you look at the tree sizes that there are in a given binomial heap, the tree sizes have a very nice property. A tree of degree k has two to the k nodes in total. That's just a simple consequence of the recursive way that binomial trees are defined. And so the presence or absence of a tree of any given degree in a binary heap of size n corresponds to the digits when we write out n in binary. Let's look at this heap here. It has nine items in total. Nine is one, i.e. two to the zero, plus eight i.e. 2 to the 3, or in binary, it's 1, 0, 0, 1. 
I've ended up writing my binary numbers backwards here, the least significant digit on the left, just because by habit I write my binomial trees that way around. But anyway, you can see the general pattern very clearly. And so pretty much anything we do with a binomial heap ends up being related to powers of two and to binary digit expansions and so on. Let's have a look now at the complexity of the three operations we've been looking at. The complexity analysis is all based on the numerology of powers of two. So here are a few more handy properties. Pause the video, have a quick read and then press play. OK, complexity analysis. Let's start with push. When we push a new item, we simply create a new degree zero tree and add it to the list. And then perhaps we have to go through a whole sequence of mergers. The maximum number of mergers that we have to do is equal to the number of trees in the heap, which is at most log n, because that's how many digits there are in the binary expansion of n. To be absolutely meticulous, the number of digits is the floor of the log to base 2 of n plus 1, but log n is good enough for big O analysis. Next, decrease key. This involves bubbling up the node whose key we just decreased, and we have to bubble it up far enough so that it doesn't violate the heap condition. In the worst case, it will be the very bottom node of the largest tree. The largest tree has size log n, as we said, since that's how many digits there are in the binary expansion of n. And it's pretty easy to check that a binomial tree of degree log n has height log n. So that's the complexity. Finally, pop min. This one was a bit more involved. First, we had to find the minimum item by scanning the roots of all of the trees and there are O of log n trees because that's how many digits there are in the binary expansion of n. Next, we extract the root of this tree and we promote its children. And the number of children is equal to the degree of the tree, which is O of log n. Finally, we have to do a whole bunch of merging trees of equal degree to get back to a binomial heap. This is actually just like adding together two binary numbers, one number corresponding to tree sizes from our original heap, the other corresponding to the tree sizes of the nodes that just got promoted, and both numbers have big O of log n digits. Therefore, the total number of mergers is big O of log n. OK, so that's the binomial heap. I wanted to go through all these operations and their complexities because we're going to push really hard to get a very fast priority queue, and we'll end up needing lots of careful thinking along these lines about tree shapes and number of mergers and so on. Let's summarize where we've gotten to. We've looked at two implementations of the priority queue, the binary heap and the binomial heap, and these are the complexities that we found. It all looks a bit like a waste of time. All three operations are big O of log n on both implementations. Well, actually, that's not entirely fair. Let's have a closer look at pushing into the binomial heap. We push a new item simply by adding it as a new tree of degree 0. And then we have to go through this merge procedure. And there can be up to log n mergers, which is why this complexity is big O of log n. But think about the next push. For the next push, we don't need to do any mergers at all. If you think about the binary digit view of a binomial heap, we're adding one each time we push a new item. So we're flipping the least significant bit. So we're guaranteed that every second push is O of 1. It's fairly easy to turn this into a rigorous argument, and that's what you'll be asked to do on the example sheet, in fact. And the conclusion is that in the binomial heap, pushing is actually big O of 1 amortized. OK, so we've won a little bit of improvement over the binary heap. What about the other operations here? Can we speed them up too? 
We're going to concentrate on push and decrease key. These two are called more frequently than pop min when we're running Dijkstra's algorithm. So can we find a way to make them both big O of one? Pause the video, have a think, and see what you can come up with. There are very many dumb answers and there's a very, very clever answer that we're going to see in the next video. But I want to talk through a dumb answer first, because even a dumb answer can have something to tell us. I'm going to show an implementation in which push and decrease key are both O of 1, but the price we end up paying is that pop min ends up being very slow. I'm just going to use a plain doubly linked list to store all of the items. Let's say I'm also going to keep track of the smallest item. It's totally trivial to push a new item, we just stick it onto the end of the list. And we may possibly have to update the min item pointer also. And this is all O of 1. Good. Next, decrease key. This is very simple to do also. We simply decrease the key of the item that we're interested in. And as before, we may have to update the min item pointer. Just one note about this, when we talk about decreasing the key of an item, I'm going to assume that we have somehow gotten hold of a pointer to the item whose key we want to decrease. It would be no good if all we were told was scan through the list to find such and such an item and then decrease its key, because that scan would be O of n, whatever implementation we have. I'm going to go into a bit more detail about this at the end of the video. Anyway. Back to our blazingly fast priority queue implementation. This decrease key is obviously big O of 1. So what's the problem? Problem is obviously pop min. It's very fast to pull the minimum item out from the list thanks to the min item pointer. This is just big O of 1. But it's very slow to restore our data structure to a valid state in which min item points to the correct place. It has to scan through the entire list, and this is big O of n. The problem with this implementation is that it never learns anything. Every time we call popmin, we have to scan through the entire list to find the next smallest item, but then we completely forget most of those comparisons, and so next time round we just have to scan everything again. That's really what the binary heap and the binomial heap are giving us. They're a way that we can manifest inside the data structure, all the comparisons that we made last time round, so that the next time we call pop min, most of the work has already been done. Okay, so here's a summary of our three implementations. In the next video, we're going to look at a fourth implementation, the Fibonacci heap, which gets the best performance on each of these operations using an extremely clever amortized design.